exchange and a closer look at an organization making sure women get the education they deserve. Uh, I'm talking about the award-winning group CAMFED or the Campaign for Female Education. I was destined to be a child bride. Right now, 28 million girls in sub-Saharan Africa are out of school. Each girl has their talent and determination. They simply lack the funds. But when you educate a girl, everything changes. My colleague uh, Zane Asher spoke to the executive director, Angeline Muramurwa, about how the program works, including the concept of social interest. So Angie, thank you so much for being with us. I find this idea of social interest fascinating, and I think it really has the capacity to change lives. How did you come up with the idea? Well, social interest um, organically developed from our work with um, young women and communities in Africa. And I'll just you know, say a bit of you know, what is social interest. It is a way of paying back interest on a loan through service rather than dollars. So somebody gets a loan, and instead of paying back interest on that loan financially, they pay back through sharing knowledge, uh, mentoring, academic support, and business training to others in need. And this emerged from our work with girls and young women across Africa. We had graduated from our program, and we're committed to supporting their communities and others that were coming after them. How do you measure the wider impact of that? I mean, so girls that you have helped go on to help other girls, and then hopefully those girls will go on to help other girls on top of that. How do you measure the ripple effect? We have a very robust monitoring system. But besides that, we, we also put this as a point of celebration for everybody involved with us as an organization. For, for the young women themselves, this is an opportunity for them to show this common knowledge that you educate a girl, you educate the nation. So it's a point for celebration. So they're also very proactive about self-reporting, but we're also very good about you know, validation and verification of such results. It's important to note that obviously the principle of the loan is paid back. It's just the interest that is Definitely. paid back slightly differently. Um, how do yeah. you measure or decide how much social interest is paid back on a particular loan? So how many hours, for example, of community service, of mentoring, and that sort of thing? Uh, this is decided by the Young Women's Network. Uh, so I'll just give you a bit of information around the Young Women's Network. So girls that were supported through School by Comfort, I'm one of them. So we came together in 1998, just after graduation, and formed the Comfort Association, which is a network of young women leaders across Africa. So when we... Came, we came together and designed the social payback component of it. So, for example, for somebody with a learner guide, these are young women that are supporting girls through school and, you know, girls and boys through school, supporting them with broader learning outcomes. It's 18 months of two and a half hours support with local schools. Uh, and this is about 30 to 50 students in a class. And you provide uh, lifelong lessons on life skills, on resilience, and on all that. So that's how we designed it. This is designed by young women themselves. And one thing I find interesting is that you know, a, a girl being involved in a program like this, it, it will eventually change the perception they have of themselves. By giving back in this way, they will come to see themselves as leaders, as role models. And that affects, I think it has an impact on the sorts of jobs they end up applying for um, and, you know, the confidence they have in themselves to, you know, decide to, for example, become an entrepreneur and that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's the whole logic of, of the whole social interest system, right? It's not just about, um, I think, you know, traditionally there have been issues with women being asked to volunteer, right? So to the point of volunteering until they are empty to nothing. So this model is very deliberate about building this particular individual. So they're running their business. They are also giving to the community and they're making money from their business. They're learning new skills from their business. They're connected with leadership within the community, they learn how to negotiate, how to mobilize communities. And it's not just them that perceive themselves as leaders, it's also communities, to the point that we have traditional leaders who actually say, you know, from us having supported the education of these girls, they are now our teachers. So it's, it's important to be able to recognize that even in communities that they come from, they're also perceived as leaders, as role models, as the North Star of what's possible within such communities. Right. I mean, I think that was going to be my next question, this idea of disbanding or at least trying to limit and undo 
gender stereotyping, which exists, of course, all over the world. It exists in Africa. And we're talking about it um, being in Africa only because that is where this program is primarily focused. So how do you undo that, especially because, you know, gender stereotyping, I mean, it's so deeply rooted within certain communities. And, you know, it's existed for decades, if not centuries. For us, it's, it comes from even our origins as, as an organization. Our work primarily focuses on the education of girls. We support boys, but it's primarily on the exclusion of girls. Right now, as we're talking, there are over 52 million girls of upper secondary school age that are out of school. And, and that's an injustice in this time and age. And we know because of COVID, this is exacerbated. So for us, when we talk about, you know, challenging the status quo, it's realizing that education is an entry point. It needs to start from there. We need to give girls the opportunity to be able to get educated because that is the basis of female representation and leadership in all walks of life. Be they it's in politics, in economics, everywhere. So for us, it's coming from that perspective. We also work very closely with men, particularly men who are not afraid of equality. And, and we have you know, partnered with most of them to be able to support more girls throughout school. How do you yeah. work with women when there are much bigger societal problems at play? For example, in Ethiopia, there's a war going on. Um, there's wars going on in places like Cameroon, for example. There's obviously terrorism in the northern part of Nigeria uh, and in parts of Mozambique. How do you um, help girls who are suffering in those kinds of environments? It is important in crisis of that nature to protect the right to education for every child. It is important and fundamental to do that, particularly to ensure that that is not disrupted. And to the point that I mentioned earlier, that we need women in education, in health, in science, and it helps to have women that have survived such specific you know, context to be able to inform our response in context like that. So I would say that even in crisis, it is critical that the right to education is protected. Because oftentimes we realize that in crisis, that's usually what suffers the most. So that should be protected because we need that for today and tomorrow's female leaders. Angie, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.